to see so many of you here tonight at the Cary Institute Public Program, Friday nights, first of the new year. I'm Bill Schlesinger, president of the Institute, and I want to welcome you uh, both to this one and to uh, similar programs that we hope to have at regular intervals on Friday nights uh, throughout the spring. Uh, tonight I think we have quite a treat. It's a dual show tonight. Mary Edna Frazier, an artist, and Oren Pilkey, uh, a geologist, uh, here to talk about climate change, uh, what it means for our coastlines. Uh, we're doing this in cooperation, as we often do with Merritt Bookstore, uh, and after the uh, presentation, uh, Oren and uh, Mary Edna Frazier will be uh, outside with their book, Global Climate Change, a primer uh, in the, uh, the table you pass by uh, on your way in here. Uh, for signings and purchasings and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, but we want to get on with the, the program tonight, which as I said is a dual show. I'm going to do a little introduction of each of them, but then uh, I think they want to introduce each other in a little bit more detail and probably details that I uh, would not do justice to or completely understand. Uh, but Mary Edna Fraser is an artist uh, of uh, some note for particular uh, for doing a lot of photography out of airplanes. Apparently she's been flying and leaning out of airplanes for 25 years, uh, <laughs> photographing coastlines uh, and the Grand Canyon and other such things. And these then form the basis for batiks uh, that she uh, paints. There's a batik hanging out in the lobby here uh, tonight, so you can see an example of her work and they are used to illustrate the book that they've done here uh, together. Uh, she has uh, been doing this for quite a while in a number of uh, uh, settings, uh, but I think one of the most noteworthy things is having her own show uh, at the Smithsonian uh, Air and Space Museum in Washington, and a, a single, single uh, authored show, I guess is what they say for artists, something like that, uh, and uh, uh, for the batiks. Uh, and uh, I think you'll find them quite beautiful in, this, in the story behind them. Uh, fascinating. Uh, Oren Pilkey, an uh, old friend of mine, uh, more than 30 years. Uh, when I arrived at Duke, and Oren was already a fixture in the geology department at Duke, uh, has uh, a reputation throughout the state of North Carolina. There's probably no man that coastal real estate developers hold in lower esteem than Warren <laughs> uh, But he's a geologist of the, of the uh, uh, character that I most admire. Uh, he fully believes in data. Uh, he's skeptical of computer models uh, for uh, predictions of the future. Uh, he's probably made a career of data uh, using I don't know whether it's Aristotle or somebody else that came up with the law of conservation of mass uh, by looking at coastal erosion with the simple uh, belief that if you take sand from one place and put it, you can put it somewhere else, but it's the same amount of sand. You're not going to create sand in that process. And uh, much of what Lawrence uh, has to say uh, to coastal developers and people that want to build on the coastline and manage the coastline and think about the coastline in the future. Uh, really comes down to realizing that there's only so much sand to go around uh, and you can move it around uh, but you can't magically uh, have more of that appear. Uh, Oren is uh, a longtime Duke faculty member, now emeritus uh, in the Nicholas School of the Environment there, uh, author of multiple books, two I think with, with Mary Edna Fraser. Uh, so this is the, the second or is this the third? This is the second. Uh, and uh, numerous papers in various uh, journals of coastal geology, coastal geomorphology, uh, where his name, uh, both up and down this coast and up and down the west coast, uh, is synonymous with understanding the proper management of coastlines and, and their future. So we're going to start with Mary Hedden tonight, uh, who will tell us uh, her experience in putting this book together and her experience photographing coastlines and understanding coastlines from the artist's point of view. Uh, and then in the tag team, they will pass it off uh, to Oren Pilkey. Welcome to you both, and welcome to everybody here tonight. Very good. Thank you so much. This is a beautiful part of the world. I just love it here. And uh, if we can lower lights a little bit. I don't know if you do that. 
But um, I'm from Charleston, South Carolina, and this is my granddaddy's 1946 air coupe. And my brother has taken it apart and put it back together, and we fly it all over the East Coast primarily. And I've been using film cameras, Nikon FM2s, and I just switched to digital with a Nikon um, D90. I've flown the whole east coast of America, and this is me forever young. It was shot in 1993, my Amelia Earhart. <laughs> and uh, Charleston is where I live, which is a coastline with many barrier islands, and people always wonder how I teamed up with Orin. My father came to the house with a uh, movie of Orin beating his hands on a table saying, you can't do this, it's really wrong, and about uh, jetties and uh, shorelines. And my dad said, I think we can help this guy. <laughs> so my daddy flew me to see Orin at Duke University, and we went and flew the Outer Banks of North Carolina in 35 knot winds, took over 500 photographs, and then um, I talked him into letting me be his sidekick. This is my brother. My daddy's a master pilot, and my brother is uh, well, just a wonderful pilot. It's almost acrobatic what we do. We're a well-oiled team. And the, the way that the air cube is, you can just lower the wing and take pictures. A lot of times when I'm going somewhere, I'll rent an instructor in a plane that I haven't flown so I can have a new joy ride and set up my shots. <laughs> So the Outer Banks of North Carolina are, uh, I'm a North Carolinian, so is Pilkey, and my job is to uh, bring attention to the barrier islands on the outside, which actually North Carolina kind of looks like a breast, and that looks like a storm going by. So this piece, every piece I do is a prayer for somebody, and this one's for my friend that had breast cancer. So the piece is uh, 54 inches wide. Silk comes in 36, 45, and 54 inch widths. This is my boss before he got gray hair. And this is what we're dealing with. After Hurricane Hugo came through uh, Charleston, our buildings were out on the sand. And uh, we're having more and more trouble as development uh, encroaches on waterfront property. I met Warren on Core Banks. We went to Core Banks, and that was when we decided we shook hands to make um, a book together on the celebration of the world's barrier islands. And the colors aren't real. That day I was putting mustard on my bread. So that's how that became that color. <laughs> I'm using Procyon dyes, which were invented in 1952. I'm the first generation to have fast film digital image, satellite images. So uh, a lot of things have come along in one lifetime. But I'm still using the ancient tools. The chanting tool has a little tiny spout, and I heat up beeswax and paraffin, dip it into the bowl of uh, wax that's heated, and then use it to make fine lines. It comes out kind of like Cairo syrup. This is where I live, and this is my self-portrait. Don't it look great? Um, full moon over the Carolinas, and uh, that's my creek, James Island Creek. So to make it in my studio, I'm waxing out the white of the moon, which resists the next dye bath. Uh, Batik began well before the Middle Ages. China, Japan, India, Africa, Greece, they all claim it. Indonesia is where we think of it. The dye room has... Um, uh, fans that will exchange, it will pull up a thread or pull up the dyes. Every single dye is a different chemical equation. So I've waxed out the white and I'm putting on a blue dye bath on one end, looking skeptical as I do, and going to the other side and putting the orange, meeting in the middle and pulling it through underneath. So I'm making the dyes become part of the cloth. So that's the first dye bath, and then you wax and dye and wax and dye and wax and dye until you have your image. I can usually do four dye baths. 
You iron it out between newspapers to take out the wax. This piece belongs to the American Embassy in Thailand. And it, it, when you go see our ambassador, it's on the left-hand side of the elevator. It's four feet wide and seven feet tall. And that image came from an atlas. And the East Coast came not from an atlas, but from a, a photograph, because I didn't like the way they looked on the other side. But the colors are from the Monet painting of a lady holding an umbrella. I don't know if you know that particular piece. Uh, when the Smithsonian gave me a show, that was whenever I called up Oren, and uh, I wanted the, it's the largest museum audience in the entire world. And I wanted my work to be more than pretty, so I wanted it to teach and inform. And luckily, Oren said he would do wallboards and teach. And it's a wonderful experience. I wanted to know why the coast of Maine is different from the coast of the Carolinas and Georgia, where I fly. And it's because of glaciers and because of geology. And it's just all very fascinating to me. So this is the coast of Maine, from one end to the other made by glaciers, so it has a really different look. Um, we went, I went to, um, uh, where am I, Venice. Venice, and the Grand Canal is on that island in the middle, but you can see how putting a jetty out makes one island go forward and one go back, so you're kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul. And that became the cover of our book. It took us 10 years to make. It was 2003 whenever we finished it. It was Columbia University Press. To prove to Pilkey that I could be an assistant to him, I, um, he brought a map. He was working with National Geographic, and he brought a map of Columbia. And nobody had ever illustrated these islands. And they were just being um, ground truthed at the time. And I asked him what he wanted illustrated, and he wanted to show the tidal currents and where the actual islands are. Because from an aerial photograph, you can't tell because the mangroves hide the islands themselves. And so this is flying around where I live in um, Charleston, just north of Charleston. Having a good time. And you can take a really bad photograph and make a nice piece of art. This is Deweese Island. Um, I'm gonna, there's a show that goes with our book called Our Expanding Oceans, and that is in North Carolina now. It's going to be in Ithaca at the Museum of the Earth in 2013, January through May. And this is flying in my backyard, looking back at the ocean behind Hawley's Island. I own that piece. I don't own many of my pieces. Sometimes I'll do something with a pencil to draw, and then it becomes a giant piece of art. I do the biggest batiks in the world in history so far. Um, this one's 21 feet tall. This is working on it. I've waxed out the white, dyed it a yellow, waxed out the yellows, beiges, dyed it the blue of the rivers, and I'm starting to wax over the blue. And then it becomes a piece of art. Yay. And I have to stand on, people say, how do you do it? And I stand on ladders to draw. And this one's Monterey Bay in California. And, uh, the prayer of this one is, um, it's, uh, uh, my stepson has a disease, and that you can't see his disease. So the canyon is kind of like that. You can't see this disease underwater. It has feathers and tears and hearts. So there's always emotion. Uh, to work with Oren, he'll give me the scientific papers, which I will read. And uh, Erk Remnitz was a scientist that had all the information that we needed. And we kept looking at movies. And I couldn't find anything in the Arctic that I was really excited about. But this looks like a moon in a nest of stars whenever it becomes art. It's 54 inches wide. We use universities or colleges to help us grow our projects and let us spend time together. So our expanding oceans began at St. Olaf's College. The Global Climate Change book is with Duke University Press. 
And um, it's very dense reading, but it's very interesting and very factual and scientific. This is just one of the first computer-generated uh, images in a magazine, which became a 47-inch by 47-inch batik of the earth. So wax out the white, dye it the light blues, wax out the lighter blues, dye it the oranges and yellows, wax over that, then put in those little mountains, wax over that, put in the darkest values of the indigo sky and mountains for death. I work for NASA and I work uh, with NOAA and this is the first image in history taken from a satellite of Mauna Loa and it became a 184 inch by 36 inch fatigue. And it kind of looks like a flower that you would see that's tropical. This is Selinga Delta, which is in Siberia on Lake Bacal, which is the deepest and the um, so the deepest and the old, the deep, deepest, I forgot the other thing, but it's, it's I know it's the deepest lake on um, Earth. And uh, I, I like it because it, it was my first Google Earth image. Because we, before that, we have to research all kinds of places. This piece belongs to NASA. Every year NASA picks an artist. It can be a dancer or uh, anybody. And I was their artist one year. So I got to look at every single photograph in history that had been taken at that time. It was 1994. And um, this piece was stolen, by the way, before it got to a show by FedEx. Somebody in FedEx got it. But it is 93 inches by 36 inches of the Amazon River. And the yellow shows deforestation. Um, fires that are in Australia called Black Friday, it's at this Wilson's Promontory. Uh, they had so many fires, I think it was 400 fires on that day. So this is the drawing on the silk, and then the dye bath, and then there's the wax, and I wear flip-flops, waxing over that first dye bath putting down another light value, waxing over that. This is looking from up top. You flip them over all the time and look at them, look really serious. And uh, wax and dye, keep on dying, waxing. And a lot of times I get a whole lot of pieces going at once. And that's the final piece, what it looks like, whenever all the wax and dye comes out. And this is flying over Lake Murray in Australia. And it was just the most arid landscape I've ever been in, except for Lake Murray. Uh, it's a very dried up landscape, and that's why you have so many fires. Flooding is another thing that we will see more of as we have global climate change. And that is, this is St. Louis in 1988 and 1993. The red is the city of St. Louis, and that's how big that the flooding got. And you've had experience with that type of thing. I'm sorry. And this is Hurricane Katrina. And this is from uh, NOAA and NASA worked on providing this image together. This is also a NOAA and NASA photograph. And it was 11 days of photographing put together. Um, and the orange is the Gulf oil spill. The little white things are the tiny little boats platforms trying to clean it up. So that's quite an image, isn't it? Um, Jay Apt took this photograph of the Pacific, over the Pacific, the full moon over the Pacific. He took it with a Hasselblad and ectochrome film. So we're really, this is an interesting piece. It's a, it's a composite. The, the uh, this is a, a Iceberg on top came from Antarctica. The iceberg on bottom came from the Arctic. But Ralph Clevenger put it together, and then I made a boutique of it and paid for the rights and talked to him. It's really interesting how many people you get to meet that you can respect. So this is the largest boutique in history on Earth, and it's Buckminster Fuller's uh, Dymaxium map. 
but it, it was hanging in a trapezoid atrium that was uh, four stories tall. And this is working on that, waxing out the white. And this is what, putting in the blue, and waxing out the blue and dyeing the land. This is my assistant helping me iron it. You have to iron it five minutes per square foot to heat set the dyes. And then I got bored, so the next time I did it, I went the opposite way with the land first. This is hanging it, and a man got up in there and uh, moved around to get it up. This is a moon, a moon in Green, Greenland, and it's a very fam famous photograph, but this great big gush of water goes through the ice and then it breaks off, it's warmer than the ice, and then it breaks off ice. And this is what is happening in Greenland to increase the sea level rise. This is waxing with the chanting tool on um, Glacial Canyon, which is Triumvirate um, Glacier in um, Alaska. This is in Alaska also, and it's Mount McKinley. And a friend of my parents took it, Mr. Wilson. Uh, this is Bhutan, and I was working for NASA again for the Folk Life Festival, and the Bhutanese enjoyed watching me make this piece uh, and see their country come to life. This is Mount McKinley, no, this is Kilimanjaro, and it's outside. And I have to part, you have to pardon me, it's a little wrinkled because it was in my suitcase. Um, this is interesting. This is Charleston where I live. The one on the left is Charleston not flooded. The one on the right is Charleston flooded with a 4.6 foot tide, which is predicted. And that's uh, the why this is an issue important to me. So many people live close to coast. And this one, oh, help me, Pilkey. Spencer Gulf. All right. And, um, so he just wanted me to show the barrier islands of different geologic ages. And I wanted it to look like an oil spill. This is a pteropod, which is a little tiny creature that's on the bottom of the food chain. And it has paddle-like wings, and they call them sea butterflies. And they're being destroyed by the, um, the temperature changes, which is the bottom of the food chain. In the, um, out on the Northwest Passage, uh, with an icebreaker ship, have they gotten through, Warren? They've gotten through with an, uh, and I wanted it to look like an old world map, because our maps are always changing, because uh, lands do shift. In the city of Boston, I just pretended I was God and wiped out the people living in the front. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I did. But that, that was just for fun. <laughs> and this is flying near my house in Eddingsville Beach in South Carolina. And I had taken a picture um, a long time ago, and Pilkey recognized the beach because of that interesting, um, um, it's an intertidal, I forgot the word for it. Yeah, where the town fell in. There was a town there. And then... Uh, it was. It, it is gone now, and it's way, way out to sea. This is Shishmaref, and it's on the top of the Western Hemisphere. And um, I wanted it to feel like totemic canoes sailing through um, dark waters. Atafu Atoll, and um, Pilkey will tell you more about these things. I'm just showing you little pictures. This is a, the Ocracoke in North Carolina, where my dad and I landed in a 35 knot wind, and I got out of the plane, and I must have looked terrible, because the guy said, what are you, a wing walker? <laughs> <laughs> this is a Bangladesh, with the Himalayas on top. And this is um, Mekong Delta. But it kind of feels like a Buddha with the barrier islands or like the folds in his bed, belly. He looks like a skeleton with the red China Sea. Pilkey took the photograph for this. It's uh, Laguna Madre. 
in Mexico. I got to go um, snorkeling and it took 22 photographs to make this underwater picture in the Great Barrier Reef. And they're just kind of all put together. It's about nine feet tall. And there we are with the one that got me my job in the first place. Tsunamis, storms are increasing. So this was the great big tsunami that wiped out so many people. This is flying in the Everglades. Every single place I go, it's just so interesting to me how different the landscape is from one place to another. But uh, this one, it kind of looks like Darth Vader, upside down. <laughs> and I'm going to turn it over to my boss. This is, um, this is a Morris Island lighthouse, which is out to sea. that used to bring people in, and our Earth looking from the moon. I was, I think, seven years old. And Ornithoke is a kind of man you either love or you hate. And I happen to love him. So I, uh, I learn a lot from my boss. <coughs> Thank you, man. I got one. I think I have one here. Oh, you got one. Okay, I'm going to turn this off. Important thing to remember is, is that um, 
I, I, I would like to get people to stop reading thermometers when it comes to trying to say that we're, we're getting warmer, because reading thermometers of the Earth's surface and getting a global average is very complex. But we have all the other things which clearly show that the, that the Earth is warming. There's no question about it. There is just no question about whether or not the Earth is, is warming. Now, whether there's a human connection, which I firmly believe the evidence is strong, I mean, that's another matter. You don't, you don't have empirical direct evidence of the human connection. Here is a, this is a, a Michael Mann diagram showing the increase in CO2. Whoops, can't see the bottom. So I'll go on to the next one. One of the things that I find uh, fascinating is that the more knowledge we have, if you read the sciencedaily.com, it's a really neat uh, uh, website. Um, they, if you read them, you'll see every every day they come out, with something, well, every week at least, there's somebody who's got something else that's going to uh, affect global warming one way or the other. And the one that's fascinating, and of course, the more you have, the more the less certainty you have as to the absolute prediction of what it's going to be like by the year 2100. My favorite is a paper on jellyfish. And jellyfish, as you know, uh, moved by, by doing this. And the, the uh, author of this paper said that jellyfish mix water very well. Therefore, the, the ocean is going to absorb more uh, CO2, and therefore, there's going to be less uh, warming. And he also pointed out that the when, when you have highly when you have pretty polluted water you get less uh, you'll get more jellyfish. He, he didn't quite say it, but what he was implying that if we get more polluted water we may get uh, less warming. But I don't think that's what he was implying. This is a um, this is the permafrost thing that you, that, um, you can see. I've seen recent pictures of of what I call drunken forests in Siberia where the trees are going in every which direction and also uh, uh, a building tipping over highways and railroads getting kind of looking strange. And as acidification, boy, this is an important one. And uh, what this diagram shows is that basically is that, is that as the ocean, as we get more CO2, we get uh, a more acid environment. And it's already come to the point where in Oregon, for example, we have uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, they have um, uh, oysters that uh, cannot grow, they, they're trying to grow commercial oysters there and they found they can't get the spat to get to have to deposit calcium carbonate, at least at first, until they lower, the, until they change the pH of the water. So it's for real. Here's the big picture. For the last 60 million years, we've been getting cooler and cooler and we're way down here. That's where we are now, very cool relative to what it was like 80 million years ago. So this is a relatively cool period in, in the big picture. And <coughs> here's what sea level rise looks like according to high gauge operations, a, a 2006 uh, diagram. We have two, two uh, lines of evidence for um, uh, sea level rise. One is tide gauges and the other is satellite observation. We have 20 years of satellite observation and we have 150 years of tide gauge observation. Here, here's one way to interpret that. It goes like this, or you could do it like this. And uh, that's questionable, especially that last one up there. It, it's illegal to draw a curve from a low point. However, however, what gives that credibility is that number there, 3.2 millimeters per year, is what the satellites are coming up with for an average of uh, average sea level rise per year. Well, what's the evidence? All over the world, we have a World War II uh, uh, implements that are, that are on the beaches. We have uh, some of the pillboxes from Normandy are now sitting on, on the beach. And this is one, this is actually a World War I implement, an eight inch cannon that was protecting the capital city of, of Mozambique during World War I when the, the Germans were in, in East Africa. And, um, but they, um, the, the channel that this thing was protecting is only 300 yards away. So an 8-inch gun from 300 yards would do quite a bit of damage. No, no need to correct for the Coriolis part. This is a um, uh, washaway beach. I took this photograph on a, on a typical wet, uh, dark day on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. But you can see four pipes 
um, which were the sources of water for four different cottages, all of which have fallen in here, which were the shoreline was eroding about 100 feet per year. Here's another washaway beach photo. I was fascinated when in the Durham Morning Herald, a local, a local rag in, in Durham, North Carolina, came out with a three or four sentence article saying that last night the shoreline retreated 1,000 feet in Washaway Beach, Washington. And I thought, boy, that's, that's really amazing. Well, here's what happened. It was a slump. And um, this happened on areas where you have a lot of rainfall and where you have a high tidal amplitude and where you have a deep channel right offshore. And if you had been sitting here with a picnic table or something like that, you would have become part of the geologic record. <laughs> um, well, this is uh, uh, Nagshead, North Carolina. That house there is the house that was in the dreadful movie um, Oh, night that will dampen. It was a horrible movie. It was horrible for several reasons. For one thing, it had this house right on the beach, and every high tide, the, the water would come under. This is sweet and nice as can be. That's a perfect place to have a house where the tide, high tide comes under the house. And then they had a storm, and they stayed right in there, and, and the shutters banged back and forth. But you should, if you haven't seen it, don't see it now. <laughs> <laughs> but here, can you see this curve? That curve, and that curve, and that curve. Each of those curves is where the, where the higher swell is going to see, and they've had to move it back. And we continue to move it back on a, on a fairly regular basis. This is what it looked like after Hurricane Irene. And I think there's that. There was a dreadful house, the house from the dreadful movie. Um, <clears throat> well, we have lots of evidence of. of uh, more subtle evidence of sea level rise. Here, here are some stumps, as you can see, in, in a salt marsh. And um, these stumps have died because they've been, the roots have been drowned. Um, it, it, it's not because of erosion, but it's because of sea level rise. <coughs> and it, it's a matter of the, the fresh water actually comes up high into the salt water, pushes up the fresh water, which in turn will um, cause the, uh, the tree to die. And those trees in the background, you can see a lot of them are dead. That's, that's sea level rise. Whether that's due to subsiding of the land or whether that's due to true sea level rise or some combination, we don't know just from that photograph. We've had a lot of communities that have fallen in uh, back in the old days. The one that, that I find most fascinating is the one that, uh, that Mary Edna mentioned, adding to a beach uh, in South Carolina. A lot of the local people didn't even know about uh, Eddingsville Beach. This is you saw this. Uh, Mary Ed had this photo. It, 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 it's out here now somewhere. It was a community of 60 houses and two churches and one billiard or one bar. And uh, um, and it was before the Civil War. It was a very important town for, for the rich from Charleston to come down and spend the summer. Uh, at least the families would, while the, while the, uh, 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 the leader of the family, the, the father, would, would stay, stay back and work the slaves on the plantation. Uh, but at any rate, it, it died completely in the, in the great Sea Island storm in 1893, and now it's about a quarter mile offshore. Here's a really fascinating bit of evidence that uh, it's from a German postcard. 1969-1989. If you look closely, you can see they are exactly the same scale. But you can see that the islands have gotten thinner uh, in those 20 years, and that's a sign of sea level rise. Obviously, the islands cannot have been doing this very long, or they would long since have disappeared. And we think that this is an island's mechanism for preparing for sea level rise because islands have to be about 100, maybe maximum of 200 meters wide in order to mine it, in order to be overwashed during, during storm. The same thing happened to the outer banks of North Carolina. Uh, we're getting thinner, but where we haven't stopped it with a seawall. Here, here's a, 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 a bridge abutment in Miami. And a geologist, Hal Wanless, discovered this in the, in the photo, final photos of a, of a biologist. And he got all excited about it and showing the sea level rise. So we ran down, it's a 1990-something. We ran down there to see what had happened in the 1990s. And unfortunately, the species changed. 
so there was no way to, to continue to, to measure sea level rise. Now, we don't know whether that's the, um, the abutment sinking or whether that's the sea level rising again or, or some combination. Here's the highest sea level rise in all of uh, North America. This is an 8.1 feet sea level rise caused by this um, uh, oil refinery here. It's pumping, this is at, um, in a suburb of the southern part of, uh, of Houston. And, um, and the, the um, oil refinery is using a huge amount of water and, and the land is contracting and, does, and will not come back. So 350 houses there were removed and it's now a, a park with all salt marsh it's all a park now. <coughs> Um, well, at the present time, the, the bulk of the sea level rise, which is a little bit more than a foot per century, at, at the Duck Pier in North Carolina, which is a really good pier because it's concrete and it's sitting out in the ocean, and it's showing a foot and a half per century sea level rise there. Um, we think that the primary cause of thermal expansion of the ocean as it warms uh, water does expand when it's heated. You've got so much water in the ocean, especially the upper 700 meters, that it can cause a significant sea level rise. The interesting thing about this is that um, the uh, sea level, uh, let's see, um, oh yeah, is that thermal expansion is going to continue for centuries, even, even if we turn CO2 around right now or whatever uh, ever is happening. The thermal expansion will continue for centuries. Uh, we think in the 21st century, the Antarctic will be the most important source of water. Uh, you can see we didn't even, the IPCC, the Intergovernment Panel on uh, Climate Change, didn't even consider uh, the Antarctic, which is probably a mistake, but definitely a mistake. Here is the Muir Glacier in Alaska, 1941 photo, and here it is in 2002. Um, this, is a, this is a photo taken by Bruce Molnia, one of my former students, and he, uh, he took a picture, he took photographs of all the glaciers, the glaciers that, that when they came out to the sea, and, uh, uh, and compared them with, with older photos when they could find them. Uh, if all the ice, if all the glaciers in Alaska melt, Tomorrow, the sea level would rise between one and, and two inches. If all the mountain glaciers of the world, including the Himalayas and, and, and the ones in South America, if they all melt, sea level would rise would be one and a half to two feet per well, period. Um, so that's not too much. Uh, and Greenland, though, if all Greenland melts, um, then we would, can expect a sea level rise of about 20 feet. <coughs> The Greenland is rel relative to the Antarctic. Greenland is simple, relatively simple. That is, the, hot, the warmer it gets, the more it's going to melt. Um, the problem with looking at glaciers and, 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 and guessing how much is, is actually melting is that, that, yes, you're seeing a lot of melting on the edges, but uh, there's a lot of snow being contributed to the interior every winter. So you have to, you know, you have to balance those two. Um, in the Antarctic, though, that's where the action is going to be here, is Western Antarctica. If, if Western Antarctic uh, melts, we'll have 16 feet of sea level rise. If we include East Antarctic, West Antarctic, and all the mountain ice, we have two, 220 feet of sea level rise. We don't think that's going to happen for a while, but this, uh, this is the Ross Ice Shelf, and this is the the Rome Filchner uh, shelf. There is the biggest, there is the reason that uh, the uh, Antarctic is not a straightforward thing because we think that those shelves are, they're, they're 200 to 400 meter thick uh, layers of floating ice. And we think that they're holding back the glaciers. And if those ice shelves break up, then the glaciers start to go down their gangbusters and, and the melting will greatly increase. And, and something else is happening too. Recently, some scientists, uh, American scientists, are measuring uh, warm water coming up along the uh, uh, margins of the Antarctic. Now, warm water in the Antarctic is one or two degrees above freezing. 
but that's enough to cause significant melting. So, so putting these things together, it, the Antarctic the potential for the Antarctic is is very very strong. Here is a ice shelf breaking up a small one called the Larsen B. This is the Larsen ice shelf of here. And it did, just as, as the glaciologist predicted, when it broke up, the glacier started flowing very fast. But it's a very small, these are very small glaciers, so this didn't have much impact. But it's a lesson to be learned uh, for the larger ice shelf, especially the larger ice shelf. Well, you look around the country, and you see a number of estimates of sea level rise, um, mostly done by local panels of scientists. But I think we can, it's fair to say that the, everybody agrees that um, we should expect a minimum of three foot sea level rise by the year 2100. And the important thing about that is barrier island development is done for with a three foot sea level rise. Uh, unless you build massive seawalls on all sides of the, of the barrier island. Um, well, the IPCC is a committee of, of the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change. It's a committee of 2,500 or plus or minus people who, um, who met basically voluntarily and came up with big, uh, three big reports, one in 2001 and then another one in 2007. And um, it's amazing that they can, can you imagine a committee of thousands producing a report? Well, one of the problems with the report is that they, the wording is uh, not very good. Often it's very difficult to read, even for a scientist. And one of those mistakes, well, not exactly a mistake, but a uh, an editing problem is at one point they say the sea level is going to rise 7 to 23 inches. But then they say a couple paragraphs later, but th they say this doesn't count, the ice melting from the glacier from the, from the big, from, from Greenland and Antarctica. And then they say that's going to be the most important source of water. So um, a lot of people mistakenly thought this was a sea level rise prediction, and then a lot of other people knew about it, but they took that number in order to diminish the importance that some of the deniers or some of the skeptics. Anyhow, so um, in the 2000s, they're very aware of this, this thing. I think in, in the next report, but not going to be not too far off, I am sure they're going to have this thing cleaned up. They need to have real people read this thing before they put it out. Um, <coughs> well, it, uh, the point here is more than the sea level rise. What's going to move, what's going to force people to move from the shoreline is not sea level rise per se, but it's all these other things. The uh, salinization that's happening in the atoll already. Um, well, where is the impact? Well, Bangladesh is perhaps the most famous of the impacts that we hear a lot about. This is where 14 million people live below this one meter line here. And those 14 million people have got to move within probably 20 or 30 years back up here, in, well, into Bangladesh. Now, Bangladesh is among the most densely populated countries in the world. They can move, if they could, to Burma, which is much less densely populated here, and maybe to India. But we have this thing called a national boundary here. And that creates problems, of course. And this is why the Pentagon is the Pentagon, by the way, is one of the big believers in climate change. Amazing. They're raising their top in North of Virginia and, and they're studying the problem of, uh, envir of environmental refugees because they assume that there will be a lot of people, that there's going to be a lot of conflict uh, when people try to get out of here. So, um, and here is Mary Edmund Batik on, on, the, uh, on the Mekong Delta. Uh, looking at both the Mekong and the Red River Delta in, in, in Vietnam, we have the largest portion of a population of a country is going to be displaced in, in Vietnam. And the predictions are that many of these people will, many of the fishermen and so forth here and the rice growers here will move to uh, Ho Chi Minh City. But one third of Ho Chi Minh City will be gone. So uh, Vietnam has a very serious problem. Here, Gulf and Island, Alabama. Um, this is right after Hurricane Katrina, 
all of this, see the shoreline used to be there, and um, and now it's there. They, they bulldozed most of this back to build up the beach. This, this community, this part of the community, the western half of the island, had been destroyed five times since 1973. This is the only uh, bear out of Alabama, and also it's Alabama. So they keep on doing this again and again. It, it's uh, societal madness. Um, in the Arctic, Mary had to show the Batika of these islands. In the Arctic, here, here's the community of Shipwrecks right there. And in the, in the Arctic, um, we have three things happening which are increasing the rate of the world all the way across the top of Siberia and, and uh, Norway and, uh, and, the, and northern Canada and on the um, um, and in the northern, northern Alaska as well. What's happening here, these things are, first of all, you have the rising sea level, then you have the melting permafrost in the beach. Every summer a lot more sand is loose than it used to be, and then we have the problem of longer ice-free summers. Uh, in, in Schistbrad here, the, usually they were frozen in by late September, and now they're frozen in by late November. And so the community goes through storms that they never used to go through. It, when the storms hit in November, normally everything was frozen. It didn't matter. It might have been, might have been uncomfortable, but it wasn't. Here's the community of Schistbrad. They have spent more money on building seawalls. Here's one that fell in. There's another one. Uh, there are several generations. This is the school that they particularly want to protect, but um, they spent more money here on, on seawalls than the community is worth in the total value of all the buildings. I went there two years ago. Where was it? I stayed in this house here during the winter in February uh, just to see what it was like and also to, 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 to lecture some, uh, some of the initiatives on, on permafrost. This was, as it turned out, pairing coal to Newcastle, since they had more intuition and more knowledge about it than I did, so somewhat embarrassing. But anyway, this house, um, when we walked into the house, uh, there were two dead rabbits right by the door you walk in, and two dead Arctic hare, hares, and then, then you uh, go to the front part of the building, look out the living room window, there's a balcony there, there was a big caribou sitting there, that was being hacked at. Uh, periodically. There, there was no running water and um, the toilet was a bucket and there was a 40 inch television with 50 channels. <laughs> um, um, here's, the, here's an atoll. And this is a French colony, obviously, but the, the, uh, this is, um, these, this is the, I guess they call it the canary in the mine. Um, here, in a number of assholes, particularly the Carter asphalt near uh, New Guinea. All the people had been moved off there to New Guinea where they're very unhappy, and to put it mildly. But they were moved off there because they, they ran out of water, desalinization of the, of the groundwater, and they couldn't get enough rainwater from, uh, from rain, they couldn't get enough water from rain. And they're doing the same thing for the island of Tuvalu, where the, the, uh, New Zealand has, has agreed to take 10,000 people, the total population. More interesting is what they're going to do with the Maldives, because they have more than 100,000 people there. And they're talking about buying a chunk of land in, uh, uh, or maybe in India somewhere, and moving en masse there. Um, here is a really interesting uh, list of, of cities. This is the city, this is based on, on how, what is the value of property that will be flooded by a three-foot sea level rise, assuming you do nothing. And Miami takes the cake in all in all cases. Um, here is Miami. It looks pretty low, doesn't it? Um, but what what's not shown here is the fact that if you look at if you look at some ponds within the city of, of Miami, uh, we can see tides. There are actual tides that correspond to the tides offshore. And they're, only, they're very small, but they correspond on the to the tides offshore, which means that the city is sitting on top of something very, very poor. And it's the Miami limestone, or the Miami oolite, which is sometimes called. 
And so if you build a levee, a seawall, whatever you want to build around the city at sea level rise, it's not going to make the slightest difference. Uh, they have another problem in that the mayor doesn't believe in sea level rise. Um, so the only way they're going to do this is to build, uh, to actually make a dam of the seawalls. If you're going to protect the city, they actually have to be massive dams going down 50 to 75 feet, or maybe even more sometimes. Um, if you're living in Miami, you probably want to uh, sell. <laughs> uh, well, here's some of the towns, the cities that are, 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 are in trouble. Uh, Karachi is a, is, a, is a big trouble. But the problem is the value of this property is very low, which is why it didn't appear on that list. Here's Boston. You down there at the bottom, see the, that, looks, that sure looks low. Uh, here's Hong Kong, parts of Hong Kong are low, Lagos, uh, Alexandria, Egypt, and, and Manhattan. Now the question is, um, as we, um, as we uh, start responding to sea level rise, who's going to get the money? Is it going to be Manhattan or is it going to be Florida, this row of Congo? Isn't that an amazing photograph? Look at that. That's, is that crazy? That's a moving. Uh, I'm sure there's a seawall there now, but uh, uh, that's, that's societal madness if ever there was. But who's going who's to get the money, Manhattan or, or these guys? Of course, Manhattan and Boston and, and uh, Miami and Philadelphia and Washington, D.C., they're all going to get the money, probably, uh, to the detriment of these places. So what are we going to do about hundreds of miles of high-rise life shoreline along the uh, Florida coast? something to think about. Actually, it's not, it's not Manhattan that's really in trouble. It's, it's Brooklyn and, and the Queen and Queen that are really in trouble. I had to include this. This is, this is a young lady who is quite, she, this is the high timeline here. And so she's sitting on the, on the only part of the beach that remains. Um, that's, looking, that's looking to the future. Well, I consider I'm not going to get into this in, in great detail, but I consider a lot of our problems due to coastal engineers. Now, coastal engineers are doing just what we ask them to do. Um, you know, they have the bad, and, and, and they have saved many, many thousands of homes. But the problem with the coastal engineering profession is, the, is this, this one right here, the disingenuous predictions of environmental impact. Just, just uh, very, very recently, uh, in, in South Carolina, uh, the Debbie Dew, community of Debbie Dew proposed near Marietta Town, proposed to put in four groins, wall built perpendicular shoreline. And they used a mathematical model and they said, oh, it's not going to cause any problems down there. It's not going to cause a road in Elsa. And any, anybody with one course in geology or environmental science would, would laugh at that. But that's happened quite often. So I'm, I'm very discouraged about the uh, uh, coastal engineering profession. I've written books about it. <laughs> One of them is called The Coal on the Shore. Um, the Skeptics. Okay. Here, we, here, this is Neil Hackenberger, the geologist, with a good pedigree, as you can see there. Um, and he says, sea level rise the greatest lie ever told. It's hard to say where he's coming from, but what, I think what he's saying is, and a lot of times you have ocean currents, like the Gulf Stream, they come along and impinge on, on the continental shelf. They push water up against the mainland, and that causes the sea level to rise. That's one of his one of his and that's true sometimes temporarily. But this doesn't explain why sea level is rising everywhere. <coughs> Here are some predictions by various uh, people, and two of these, two of whom are geologists. But we geologists, by and large, are pure of the driven snow. Uh, uh, this, but anyway, so we, Lee Gerhard, four inches, predicts a four inch sea level rise. When the sea level is rising right now, more than a foot, how can you say it's, uh, But anyway, this is, this is a prediction by the year 2100. These people are keeping us from really responding to this, what we should do. And here's one, here's a, a, one of a series of ads put out by the coal industry. 
Uh, and here's my favorite by Christopher Monkton, who was a science advisor, policy advisor to Margaret Thatcher in the UK. Um, I'll have to read that here. Uh, um, anyhow, this kind of this kind of treating uh, scientists with contempt is is, is, uh, is increasingly a problem in this country. Where the intellectual, where we are we are intellectually challenged, it would seem. I mean, there's so much uh, stuff like this going on that clearly is not is not justified. Um, it's okay to. to it's okay to say that uh, the global climate change thing is not is nothing to worry about. You know, as long as you say, well, it's nothing to worry about because, um, but just to just to uh, dump scientists uh, like this is not acceptable. To me. We have uh, one party here, in, in our in our sixty percent of the uh, members of the Congress that belong to one party uh, deny global change. Uh, you know, deny the human connection. Probably 40% deny that it even happened. So this is a this is a very serious problem for our society. And I think, as I observe it from afar, I think that we're worse that, that we're worse than, than the UK and and France and Holland and so forth. I think they their denier community is much less powerful. Well. The solution. If we're talking about the solution to the uh, to the sea level rise, the very first thing we should do is stop all high-rise construction along the shoreline anywhere. Because once you get a high-rise, then how you know you can't move it. You can move it, but we're not going to move it. The cost is too high. It, it is feasible from an engineering standpoint, but so what are we going to do when we have a three, maybe four-foot sea level rise with all the high-rises in, in Florida? Um, interesting question. <coughs> we have a history of retreating. This is um, the oldest shore retreating of, of, from a shoreline <coughs> that we know about. We can't say we really try to make a survey of this. But this is a, a, a hotel the, that, is, uh, as you might guess, is owned by a railroad company. <laughs> and, and it was moved back 2,000 feet. And it was moved back because of shoreline erosion. So this is a real thing. And this is in Colombia, South America, where we were did some work in Mary and showed some maps that we came up with and made a petite of them. The, um, this is a house that's being moved. And, and uh, they told us that once they moved the pilings, they could move the house in two, two men could move the house in two weeks. It was all made up of panels like this. And they were just moving it to a higher ground. Here, here the islands go up and down. As the Andes go up, the Andes, the peak of the Andes is just 25 miles from here. And as the, as the Andes mountains rise up, the coast goes down right? with a lot of tsunamis, small tsunamis, and things like that. So, and the same thing's happening in Nigeria, by the way. They have houses along there, very beautiful, a barrier out of shoreline that are being moved back in a similar fashion, just as fast as, they, as you need to move them back. And this is in Northern Ireland. Um, this is a, uh, a place where they sell stuff for those who are swimming on the feet, but they have big signs around there saying that this place is designed to be moved at sea level rises. It's designed, they say, to be picked up and put on a flatbed truck and move uh, somewhere. And here is, uh, this is next to Mary Ann the Fraser. Uh, oh, this is the Morris Island South Carolina Lighthouse. South Carolina Lighthouse. This uh, lighthouse, uh, the first lighthouse was uh, uh, destroyed in the uh, Civil War. If you saw the movie Glory, the battle that, uh, in that movie happened on this island, Morris Island. After the war, this uh, lighthouse was built 400 meters behind the island. And, and in 1945, we have a photograph showing that the lighthouse sitting on the island was a Coast Guard house sitting right next to it. Both of them about the house is about to fall in, and <coughs> and now 400 meters uh, seaward of of the uh, of the island, the island is migrating very rapidly because of the Charleston jetties, which were built in the 1890s. So um, this is 
this is good this is good shoreline management but it can't be done very many places because this is a, a most if you try to do that up here on the south shore or try to do it in cape Hatteras, the, the houses will quickly be batten down and i think that's yeah okay that's that's it i i would like to say i'm not sure mary Ed agrees with me on this but i'm, I'm pretty pessimistic in the sense that I don't think that we're going to really respond to global change, global climate change, until we have a catastrophe. Now, the way I see it now, we have, you've seen this, you can see the, the extent of, of uh, skepticism and, and denial in our society about this, about the fact that it's warming and so forth. Um, one of the arguments is, well, there's nothing happening now that hasn't happened many times in geologic in geologic time. That's absolutely true. But the difference is that we're here now. You know, we weren't there before, but now we are here, and so this global change is going to impact on us big time. So I'm I fear that it will take a, a, a major impact on the part of us, and it will be sea level rise that will probably uh, make us come to our senses. The sooner, the better. Thank you very much. Get on the main one 
And remember that the three most important things about a house never teaches is you know, three things, elevation, elevation, and elevation. <laughs> so um, hit 25 feet. You know, our coastal plains here and all around the world, the same thing. We have, we've had a sea level rise going up and down. And, and but whenever they were up and they stopped at a high point, they built barrier islands. And then, the, then, then they went back down. And so we have a, a whole string of barrier islands down uh, uh, on our coastal plains. And sometimes on the roads that you uh, cross our coastal plains, you, uh, the bumps that you run into are, are likely to be old barrier islands. That's what you want. You want to live on an old barrier island, not a new one. Very good, Ed. Our uh, many thanks for being with us tonight. Uh, we'll look forward to you guys uh, gravitating to a book signing table up front. Uh, let me urge all of you, uh, or you may need to help me. Is it February 16th? Mary Evelyn Tucker? February 10th. Third week, February 10th, uh, with a documentary movie here on the origin of the earth and a real look at uh, where we come from and where we're going. Uh, so join us February 10th for the next public program. Many thanks to you and many thanks to Arden and Marietta for being here tonight for this public program.